we can segue right into <clears throat> one of the threats of the upcoming Biden administration, assuming that there is an upcoming Biden administration. Um, and, you know, you and I talk about this a lot, that the the use of language is, or the, their control of language is, is paramount in, uh, in, it, it's a very important tool in the toolbox of authoritarians. It's necessary. It's a necessary tool. Yeah. You need to control language. You can't allow there to be free speech. Um, and we, I mean, history is replete with examples of this. Every, every authoritarian regime has limits on free speech. And obviously the United States is unique in the sense that we have much more freedom of speech than other most other countries. Yeah. So let's talk about Richard Stengel. Richard Stengel is, um, he is in charge of Biden's, let's see, let me read it, get it correct. He's the t transition team leader for U.S. owned media outlets. The fact, by the way. <laughs> they put him in charge of the media outlet. The, the fact that there are U.S. owned media outlets is already a problem, but okay. So he's in charge of the propaganda department. Let's just be clear. That's if, if, if we were going to talk, if we were going to use clear language and not double speak or new speak, we would say he's in charge of the U S propaganda department. So he's in charge of the U S owned media outlets. Um, and these are things like radio free America and whatever, right? So, so the U S like apparently does own outright some media outlets and he's in charge of them. And he wrote an op-ed in last year, that is kind of worth paying attention to. Now, just so you know, this guy, he's not someone from nowhere. He he was Time Magazine's editor. He was the chief executive of, you'll love this one, Carrie. He was the chief executive mm -hmm. of the National Constitution Center for two years. Yes. Yeah, uh, I saw he's, that. Amazing. He's, he served under President Obama uh, as the Undersecretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. Um, and here's his op-ed. Let's just pull up his op -ed. you guys you guys can look at it and enjoy it in all of its glory again this is from last year but this is the guy that the reason it's relevant now is because he's being tapped for this position so the title of the op-ed is why america needs a hate speech law okay <clears throat> I, I feel like we could stop there but we'll keep going <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i mean all right well that's enough that's enough. That's enough. We know where he stands on this, and we're done. But so and he writes right. this, this guy. This guy worked. Uh, he he has uh, something to do with the Constitution. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> interestingly, he has a he's a great phrase that he will will mention that he says about the Constitution. But <clears throat> um, he says, "Look, hey, when I was a journalist, I think he should have put journalist in quotes, probably, but okay. When I was a journalist, uh." I loved Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr.'s assertion that the Constitution and the First Amendment are not just about protecting free thought for those who agree with us, but freedom for those for the thought that we hate. Okay, so you liked free speech. Got it. Because you were a journalist and you didn't want to get thrown in jail. All right. But, <laughs> but as a government official traveling around the world championing virtues of free speech, I came to see how our First Amendment standard is an outlier. Now, interestingly enough, he writes this as if being an outlier on the global stage is a bad thing. Right. Now, to most of us, I, we would say, yes, we are an outlier. Yes, yay, we're an outlier. That makes us special. That's what makes us different and better. That's one of the better things about us is that we are an outlier on the First Amendment standard. But to elitists, and by the way, I really feel like global, so I was thinking about this. I think, I think a lot of elitists from American culture, um, they feel like they're left out of the global club because the other elitists are from these countries that have lots of power and control and work like America's kind of the redheaded stepchild. So when they go and have their, their little get togethers at Davos and everywhere else, they kind of, they're embarrassed that they're from the uncouth, uncontrollable country where there's like, there's more guns than people and we have no hate speech laws and like, oh my God, yeah. how do you control, how do you control the riffraff over there in your right. side of the pond? And like, he feels you left out, the... right? Yeah, so, he feels left out. Yeah. So to him, the fact that the first amendment is an outlier, that's a bad thing. 
We don't fit in. Hey, guys, we don't fit in with the rest of the world. Okay. It, it, you're, it, let's just pause there for one second. Just to underline what you're saying. Most sure. of us look at the fact that we are, we are a country that has a First and Second Amendment. In our First Amendment, we have the right to free speech. In our Second Amendment, we have the right to bear arms. We look at that as, as you said, as being an outlier is a good thing. We have greater protection for individual rights. But he's just writing from this position as if we all agree that somehow we should be embarrassed of these things, that this is bad. Right. And this, this, I think this betrays a lot of the elitist globalist psychology. And once you see their mentality, you see it everywhere. They want it's it's kind of pathetic. They're like they're like rich junior high school kids who just want to fit in. But Europe will have none of it because they're they're from the backward place where people have guns and free speech. They need to get their shit together if they want their country to be in the club with everyone else. Uh, so so and then he cites here's here's some follow up, Carrie. You'll love the follow up. Even the most sophisticated Arab diplomat. Yeah, that's exactly where I would go. I would ask, hey, <laughs> hey, Muslims, what do you think about it? Even the most sophisticated Arab diplomats that I dealt with did not understand why the First Amendment allows someone to burn a Koran. Yeah, of course they didn't understand that, you moron. His response is, why, they asked me, would you ever want to protect that? It's a fair question, he says. No, it's not a fair question. And the fact that you think it's a fair question reveals way more about you than what we already know about fundamentalist Muslims. Thank you. Can I can I also ask yeah. here, I thought it was, why did he pick the Quran instead of the Bible? Why did he make that choice? He's not choosing to include a little paragraph here about how people wonder why we would allow uh, the Bible to be burned. <laughs> or the flag to be burned, for example. He's picking the Quran for a reason. Well, but he did speak to the most sophisticated Arab diplomats, which I guess means the Saudis. Oh, who the hell is he talking about? I don't know what the most sophisticated Arab diplomats means, but uh, I mean, the fact that this gets published in the Washington Post as, and this guy, had, by the way, not only does it get published, this guy has clout. This guy is this guy is is in the elite class. This guy's taken seriously. This is his thought process. His thought process amounts to we're not in the cool kids club. And the Muslims don't like that we could burn the Quran. That's your argument? That's your argument. So then he says, yes, the First Amendment protects thought that we hate, but it should not protect hateful speech that can cause violence by one group against another. And here's, here's my favorite part about the Constitution that he says. In an age when everyone has a megaphone, that seems like a design flaw. So oh. let's, just, let's, let's just think about this. This guy, he was in charge of the National Constitution Center. He was on uh, Obama's staff. He's been tapped by Joe Biden to lead the American Propaganda Department. And he believes that the First Amendment has a design flaw because it, it protects hateful speech that can cause violence by one group against another. Now, this is also a betrayal of how they look at you, and you need to see how the elites look at you. They do not attribute agency to you. You do not have agency. You are farm animals. When you're prodded one way, you do X. You are, an, you are a deterministic machine to them. Speech causes violence to them because if we use the right magic words, you guys will act violently and there's nothing that you can do about it. There's no free will in this, right? Hate, hateful speech yeah. that can cause violence by one group against another. Now, by the way, every, I, and I just wanna make this also very clear. Every single political comment can be viewed as hateful speech that can cause violence by one group against another. As many people on this show that will follow this show know, I'm a voluntarist. I believe all government intervention is the initiation of the use of force. It is violence. Any political discussion, any political discussion about anything 
can, quote, cause violence by one group against the other. In other words, if you act on any political discussion, support anything, you could make an argument that it causes violence somehow. Obviously, nothing actually causes violence. People choose to be violent on their own. But this is this is so broad. This is so broad that so broad you, could, for- you could use this can capture anything. Anything falls under this definition. Literally anything. Yeah. If you say if you're a Trump fan, other Trump fans that listen, if you like Trump and you say, I like Trump, well. We already know that they consider wearing a MAGA hat hateful and in the incitement of violence and it's it's violence against minorities. We've already heard that rhetoric. So wearing a Trump hat would count as hateful speech that can cause violence by one group against another. Literally everything falls into this category. Yeah. And then well, he goes and they've on. Been pushing that before, Go before you move on. They've been pushing that for a while, as we know, the the. The social justice belief system has been pushing this idea that speech equals violence and that silence equals violence. So speech or the lack thereof equals violence. What's the end goal of that? Well, the end goal, one short term goal is they're trying to bully and 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 coerce people into speaking what they want you to speak, into speaking social justice ideology. But what's the long term goal of that? The long term goal of trying to conflate speech or the lack thereof with violence is is so that you can just you can do what he's trying to do here so that you can justify trying to change the constitution to say look words words cause violence words incite violence we have to ban certain types of speech yeah we have to well, ban and what does it mean yeah what does it mean when they ban certain types of speech it's exactly what you're pointing out it's 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 like they do look look at what happens when they decide they're going to be the arbiters of what you can say and what you can't say look at twitter look at facebook we know that there's a double standard. They will pick and choose what who is allowed to speak, what they're allowed to say, and it's not actually based on harm. <laughs> no, it can't be based on harm. And here's the thing. If you want authority, if you want power, remember, these people are power addicts. That's what they are. Um, if you want power and you've got any sort of mass population, especially a mass population that's armed and and a little bit used to a little bit more freedom than maybe a population full of slaves would be. If you want to exert power over them, you have to provide moral justification. You've got to convince them that whatever you're doing is somehow morally justified. It doesn't have to be great. I mean, obviously it's it's a wrong, it's it'll be a wrong, bad argument. It won't be it won't be correct. But there's got to be some some appearance of justification. And so the reason that you do this is because once you pr- once you say something like this, it's hateful speech that can cause violence by one group against another, stupid people will get sucked into this and be like, well, yeah, I don't want violence. We wouldn't want we wouldn't want people saying things that would yeah. cause violence. Okay. But that definition is intentionally broad enough that now any political enemy can be arrested on that premise or, or on that definition alone. It allows Arbitrary. If you want power, what you need is actually arbitrary, the ability to arbitrarily arrest people and arbitrarily assert your will. Because if all you're doing is enforcing objective laws, you don't have a lot of power. You're just a tool. But if you actually want power, you need your whim needs to be what allows you to exercise uh, uh, violent to use violence against people. And so if you want if you want that power to be actually yours. Everything needs to be legal. Everyone needs to be a potential criminal so that you can go arrest them whenever you want. Are they going to arrest uh, anyone on the left for saying horrible things? Are they going to arrest Kathy Griffin for holding up uh, a Trump head? Griffith, whatever her name is, holding up Trump's a, sev- a severed head. Yeah, severed head of Trump. No, they're not. That's not going to count as hate speech that could cause violence or incite violence. But. Uh, if someone on Milo Yiannopoulos' Twitter account says something nasty about an actress, well, that's that's violence. It causes violence and he gets banned. Yeah. Right. We've seen how, I mean, if you want to know how this would play out, if we codify it into law, just look at how it's playing out on social media and how it's played out at colleges. Who are the speakers who get deplatformed 
who are the people who are not allowed to, uh, to, to continue their speeches after they've booked them? Who are the people who get attacked if they do give the speech? Like Charles Murray, you know, who get physically right. assaulted. It, it is one-sided. It's absolutely one-sided. And so, you know, he goes on, he goes on to then say, I, this is one of the things that I, 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 we don't have to read any more of this, but he does go on to say something that really, I, I want people to understand this sleight of hand that happens. He goes on to make the argument that, I don't want to say this. He goes on to assume that the argument for free speech is a practical argument based on the marketplace of ideas. And then he goes on to say, well, that doesn't always work out. The best ideas don't always rise. Um, and therefore, the, the freedom of speech is not such a great idea. Now, that argument is not the proper argument for freedom of speech. It is removed. The, the argument for the freedom of speech is that you control your own life. You own your own life. You have a right to your own life. And it's a moral argument. The argument for freedom of speech is moral, not practical. It's, it doesn't matter if the best ideas succeed in the marketplace of ideas. They might not. In a, in a, in a group full of people who are wrongheaded or believe something that's false, false beliefs might become popular. That absolutely can happen. But that is not the reason we don't have freedom of speech because we expect the best ideas to rise to the top. Many of us do expect that often, but that's not the reason for it. The reason for that's it is the moral. Reason. The reason is individual rights, which by the way, is what they want to destroy because that's what makes the United States different than all these other countries that they wanna be in the club with. It's yeah. individual rights. That, if he wants to tear this down, he's got to tear it down from an individual rights perspective. And he can't. So instead, he pretends that the foundation of the freedom of speech is this practical argument about like, well, you get the best ideas if you let Hitler speak. No, that is not what it is. That is not what it That's is. Not what it is. You're, this goes back to the point you're always making, which is that the social justice left often grounds their arguments in morality. And I think the people who are trying to point out that this ideology is collectivist, is authoritarian, is racist, is sexist, is all of those things, um, they don't often couch their arguments against it in moral reasons. And I think that we need they to can't. start doing so. They can't, yeah. they can't because they are, no, immoral. But like, their, their philosophy is immoral. No, no, no. I'm saying the people like who push back against it. Oh, oh, they are not touch, often yeah. like we need to make the argument that you, what is immoral here is limiting free speech, that it's a moral argument. Like you're saying, yeah, it's not yeah, just sorry, a practical yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. And as someone in chat points out, which is exactly correct, <laughs> limiting free speech, it's, it's amazing how. These people speak as if you're not supposed to notice how these things get implemented. It's like, oh, we'll just limit blah, blah, blah. Well, what does just limit blah, blah, blah mean? You're not, you're not, this isn't the matrix and you're not the coder. You can't just make things happen. You have to do something. And what is it that you do? What's the one thing the government can do? Initiate the use of force. That's the one thing yeah. that they can do. That's what makes the government the government and not Microsoft or Apple or you know, a church, those other organizations are not allowed to come to your house with guns and arrest you. The government is, they yeah. initiate the use of force. So everything that they're proposing, when he says we shouldn't allow, or we should limit speech, what that means is people with guns should take action against you. If you utter the wrong sentences, if the, if the syllables that come out, if the sounds your mouth makes are not to the liking of us, People with guns should arrest you. And if he said it that way, I think a lot fewer people would be excited about the idea of limiting freedom of speech. But it, it sounds, he makes this, this practical argument about, like, well, you know, we just want the best ideas. And gee, how could we engineer the system to get the best ideas? It doesn't always work this way. Let's, let's tweak some knobs over here. But those knobs are people's lives. Those knobs are not knobs. They're not, this is not an armchair discussion. About, this is not, it's, 
It, this doesn't end with the legislator's pen. It ends at the point of a gun. It ends with a bullet in your brain. That's where it ends. That's what is mm-hmm. necessary. That threat of force is necessary to implement all of this. That's the only way it works. Yeah. And if that wasn't the only way it works, he wouldn't need power. If it worked any other way, he'd be able to just stand up and say it and it would magically happen or he could figure out some free market way to get people to behave the way he wants. But he can't. He needs the power of the government, i.e. he needs guns to force this. And that's what he wants. And and just to remind everyone, the reason this article that he wrote is relevant is because he's on Joe Biden's transition team. Right, he's going to be in charge sorry. of... Yeah. Yeah, the media. He's going to be in charge of the media. Yep. Someone who thinks that free speech needs to be limited. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, this is the thing that I think um, this is the the great disconnect. If we can start to realize that as a, as a people, if more of us can start to realize that these people in charge don't like this idea of liberty, they don't. They don't like it. They don't think of themselves as you. They're different from you. They're the architects. They're the system architects. They're the people in charge. You are just fodder. Anyone who wants to have a discussion about what the best thing for the system to do for some either greater good or some, it's always some ill-defined term that's never up to you. It's always up to someone else to decide. They view themselves as, as different. This is the aristocracy. And, and America ha- is this, I mean, from their perspective, the Enlightenment ideology is a blight on the trajectory of history because the aristocracy has always been in charge in one way or another. There's always been some form of aristocracy. There's always been some way that you, to keep the little people down. And the United States is this eyesore to them because the little people have free speech and guns and, like, technically yeah. the government's not supposed to do anything to them. Like – they technically have a hell of a lot of freedom. Technically, they're no different than the aristocrats. And that, that scares the crap out of them. They hate it. To them, the, the Enlightenment ideas is a cancer, and they're worried about it spreading. 